morning. Oh my gosh, some of you actually woke up for us this morning. This is fantastic. Uh, I'm Erica Farber from the Radio Advertising Bureau, and it's my pleasure to moderate our next uh, Heads of State. And uh, we're going to get started, because we've got a lot to go through. I'm going to sit down. If I can't stand. I'm not as uh, strong as Mr. McVeigh. So uh, anyway, joining me this morning is a third generation broadcaster. Uh, she is the chairwoman and CEO of Hubbard Radio, with 47 radio stations in such markets as Chicago, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Seattle, Phoenix, uh, St. Louis, Cincinnati, West Palm Beach, uh, Northern Minnesota, the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., which actually uh, is the number one biller in the United States, WTOP plus three, uh, 2060 digital, and a myriad of other things. So without further ado, let me bring on Jenny Morris. Woo. Woo. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, that is the coolest outfit I have seen. Can, Can everyone see, see what she's wearing? How cool is that? Can everybody see it? Radios awesome. of all kinds Awesome. on that shirt. So, Jenny, you're a third-generation broadcaster. Did you have a choice? <laughs> well, I did have a choice. And really early in my uh, personhood, I guess, I worked at Mr. Steak in a, in, as a hostess and a cook and a waitress. And I started college, and I was going to get a better waitressing job. And my dad said, why don't you just try it for a summer? And if you don't like it, I'll stop bugging you. And I never left. No. So. That was it, and I, I also never finished college. So I, I just enjoyed the work so much that, yeah, it felt very much like the right thing to do. But am I correct that you also actually rose your hand when it came to the radio part and said that that was something you really specifically wanted to do? Um, when I, the first station that I managed was KSTP 1500 in the Twin Cities. And I didn't raise my hand for that opportunity, but once I got kind of in the swing of radio, I said, thank you, Dad. I don't want to keep moving around because we're in television and some other things, too. I want to make my life in radio. And, and it's been really great. Well, first of all, on behalf of the radio industry, I want to thank you for doing that because we appreciate <laughs> that you've done that. Um, so how's business? It is getting better. Thankfully, we're beginning to kind of, you know, uh, setting aside for a moment everything that's going on in Europe, and we don't know where that's going to take us. But the last two weeks in particular, we have seen the trajectory of our sales really accelerate. So um, we're hopeful. But through all this last two years, we've been hopeful before. So we're, we're being cautiously hopeful because we don't want to count those chickens before they're hatched. No. So, but we're, everything is beginning to feel a little more normalized and business is coming at a little more rapid pace and, and uh, how wonderful to be here. Doesn't it just feel so normal? It's fabulous. So well, we're, glad we're getting that, there. We're glad to be here, aren't we? <laughs> That's great. <clears throat> so as you say, the last two years has been pretty crazy, wild. There's lots of words we can use to describe it. Grueling, sucked. <laughs> Her words, not mine. Painful, <laughs> yeah. Painful, yeah. yes. Um, but you know, we're asking everybody to embrace change. But as the leader of an important company, you also have to embrace change. And what advice do you have for us as you embrace change that will make it easier for us to embrace change? Well, gosh, that's a really heady question, and I'm not a very heady girl. But let me, I, I think that change obviously is a part of humanity, it's a part of life. We've been changing since my grandfather started our company in 1923, nearly 100 years ago. So we're familiar with change, but I'm not sure that every piece of change 
needs to be embraced right out of the gate. I, I, what I find really challenging is trying to figure out where to invest our time, talent, and treasure in exploring and exploiting the, the current changes and um, evolutions and iterations of our business and the businesses that are suddenly, you know, kind of in this ecosystem that we've lived in kind of alone for a very long time. Um, workplace change is something that is certain we're grappling with like everybody else. And I think we, we have always tried to stay as nimble as possible while staying true to the values of kind of what we're built on and what we stand for. You know, localism, commitment to talent, commitment to our communities, making sure that our advertisers' businesses are well served by the investments that they make in, in our business, um, among other things, so. You have been in the business long enough to remember a time when the business was primarily made up of independent owners. I remember those days. And there are many days I miss it. Yeah. <laughs> but now there are some very large companies that are publicly uh, supported. And, and, then, and yet there's a company like Hubbard. You're in major markets. You're privately owned. Correct. Um, you talk about autonomy. You talk about live and local. And that's not the norm. That's not the model that um, a lot of people who are in the industry today are used to. So where does that model exist in the ecosystem of the radio industry today, and where do you see the future of that model? Well, I, th I think there are companies, like-minded companies. I think Cox is still built on a lot of the same foundations. I, I think Beasley uh, embraces a lot of those tenants. Um, we can only control what we can control and to the extent that um, others don't do radio the same way we do, we see that as potentially an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a it's a kind of a double-edged sword because I think the the health and vibrancy of the industry over the long haul is certainly intertwined with local engagement and the super serving the local listener with local content. And you're in it for the long haul. We're in it for the long haul. I'm third generation. We've got a handful of people in the fourth generation that are deeply engaged in the business. And so we are in it for the long haul. We're closing in on 100, and it'll be up to them to see if there's another 100. That's great. I think it was 2020 that that was your first CRS. I think it was. Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure that. It was right before the pandemic hit. It was my first CRS. Good memory. Um, so, you know, you think about country radio, CRS is a vibrant, a vibrant organization, it's a vibrant community, and how do you see the country format within your organization? Well, uh, we've got a number of really strong country radio stations. I don't, I don't meddle with the programmer's day-to-day -day decisions, certainly about music. Um, and I'm excited about all the new music that is has, that was possibly created during COVID. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm I'm hoping that it's not just for country, but for everything. We're going to be find ourselves in the middle of a popcorn popper of new artists and new music that everybody wants to wants to play. But you know, we'll see. So, but but country, we we're committed to our country brands. We invested in CT40 with Fitz. Um, we've got great faith in, in, certainly in the format and where it will go from here. But I personally, I'm not a country music expert, but I've got a few here that would probably rather be in bed this morning than here. Hi, Jenny. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Sorry to interrupt your hangover. <laughs> That's loyalty. <laughs> That's loyalty. Um, autonomy, live and local. That's something we hear a lot about. People really want it. You really believe in it. We really believe in it, and we really uh, hold to it. It's not that we don't do some you know, syndication, and we don't share some talent across markets, but we're committed, very committed, to live local talent 
uh, in not just Morning Drive, but other parts of the day on many of our brands. And it's, it's, um, it is what sets us apart from other music sources, obviously. It's what gets us most deeply entangled and enmeshed with our communities and with our clients. And it works for them, it works for us, it works for the community, and I think it's the, going to be the lifeblood of the future of radio as we know it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, very much so. Um, some of us uh, had the pleasure of uh, hearing Bill Wilson earlier this week, uh, and you know, Town Square is doing some wonderful things, and they're a, sort of a digital first company, but still very, very committed to radio. You have a division, 2060 Digital. Talk a little bit about how that works and how you're looking at digital within the Hubbard organization. Digital is obviously a big part of our present and, and our future. In 2021, our 2060 business represented 23% of our total revenue, and that's been growing pretty steadily. Uh, like radio, it you know didn't grow at the same pace during the height of COVID, but it, it continued to grow and it wasn't hit as hard. So we've got 2060 Digital, the hub of which is in Cincinnati, but we have 2060 Digital employees in each of our markets who who sell programs to local clients, many of whom are on the radio, many of whom are not on the radio. It really operates as an agency, and the majority of the fulfillment of that work is done in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. So um, we see that as a very important part of our sales organization. We've got people dedicated to trying to figure out the best, most effective, and impactful way to extend our brands digitally <clears throat> in the never-ending plethora of ways that we are able to engage with our listeners and support our clients. Uh, and so we're kind of trying to hit it on all cylinders and also trying to be really mindful about ultimately what's going to move the needle. I mean, if it doesn't, if you can't measure something in terms of direct engagement and further embedding of a, a listener or a consumer with the brand or ultimately result in selling something, it's probably not a big, great use of our time. But we're, so we're, we've got no, far too many buckets for me to keep track of, <laughs> of ways that we're measuring each brand in terms of their engagement uh, in digital platforms. Podcasting, obviously, is also a big part of what we're working on. Mm -hmm. so. So you've got your finger in everything. Uh, mine, Greg's, Dave's, everybody's, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, we're trying. And, in, and I have to say, as much as there are days when I say, just stop, no more, I can't, I can't, I can't digest another new thing, it is, in a way, so much more fun than it used to be. I mean, it's so much more dynamic, it's so much more um, creative, uh, and so, Depending on what day it is, it's either more fun or I hate it, but yeah. <laughs> it's common whether I like it or not, so I may as well embrace it, right? <laughs> You're just like us. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no different. Um, so yesterday, New Voodoo presented um, the research from a project that they did, and I know you haven't seen it, but it really, um, it struck me the question is, how, what is your definition today of radio? Well, uh, I, my definition of radio is probably a little more insular than the consumer's definition of radio. I don't know. I think about a transmitter and a receiver and all of that. I'm, I'm, I, but I think that cons I suspect the consumer thinks of any kind of audio as as radio. Is that what they said? Uh, pretty much. But I, I think the reason I asked the question is so many of our companies, our broadcast companies, have dropped the word radio in their name, and yet you are still Hubbard Radio. Um, you know, we're the radio advertising bureau. So where do you view the word radio 
and the future of our radio industry? Well, I'm very proud of the word radio, and I, we're a very digitally engaged company, but at the core, we are a radio company, and, and that can mean different things, but it's, it's not something that I think will be changing anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we have talked about it, but I, I think it's important to really be mindful of what fuels everything else, including 2060 Digital. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have been able to start that if we didn't have, you know, the core business. And I, and I think we have to stay true to that core and keep it on course and keep it evolving, but also embrace, you know, our, our roots and, and where we started and where we are and where 75% of our revenue mm -hmm. uh, today is still coming from. Okay. So let's talk about talent, uh, next generation. Uh, we do a lot of work with college students and just recently I was on a Zoom call <clears throat> with some college students and I had a young woman uh, who's a junior say to me, you know, I'd really like to go into radio, but when I told my classmates I wanted to do that, they made fun of me and said, radio, who listens to radio? Why would you want to do that for a career? Hmm. Whoa. Uh, I'm sure you talked her off of that. Well, <laughs> still talking her off of it, but, um, you know, how do you respond to that? Well, I think I would respond to it with the fact that people really do listen to radio and yet you know as a college student I suppose that's I suppose that's its own special kind of bullying isn't it you know <laughs> oh just, I like that yeah let's right. start a social media thing about bullying radio yeah, right I mean we all know this the stats I mean people do still listen to the radio they don't listen as long or as much as they used to listen to the radio but they there's a lot more competition for their ears um, but they do listen to the radio. There's, there's just, that's an absolute fact. So why don't you send her our way and we'll be happy to talk to her. Okay, I'm going to do that. So speaking of new talent, what are you doing about attracting the next generation that are not necessarily um, Hubbard family members? <laughs> <laughs> well, we got a lot of those. But um, we, like everybody, recruitment for every role in the company is harder than it used to be. And we're, tr we're trying to be better about utilizing the LinkedIn's of the world and, and trying to recruit in new and different places. Uh, but it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge for sure. But it's, we've got a group working on it right now to try and figure out how to, how to better extend our reach um, beyond kind of traditional resources. Mm -hmm. so, but but that's true for on-air talent, it's true for traffic people, it's true for promotion people, it's true for sales people. Mm -hmm. COVID has certainly changed the workforce, mm -hmm. <laughs> not only how, how they work, but where they're working. Um, is your company now that we're hoping that doors are continuing to stay open, even with all the new variants, um, are you changing it all uh, sort of the organization and how people work within that organization? We have not had any systemic kind of corporate-wide changes to how we're operating. We are a very, a very uh, locally run business. We don't, we don't dictate a lot. Mm -hmm. We do have a certain expectation that by and large, our teams will be in the office. Not always, not Every market looks a little different. I think Seattle and Chicago are our slowest to return, but they're, you know, they're big metro areas with lots of traffic problems, and we didn't operate in unison prior to COVID. Mm -hmm. Washington, D.C., where traffic is really a problem, you know, salespeople have to be in on Wednesdays. That's a kind of always been the case. So right. um, we think that in order to feed the energy of what's going on in the studio, it's really important that those people come to work and engage with people who are also working in the business. We think it's better for the air product. We think it's better for our clients. Um, so to the degree possible, 
without creating even more recruitment challenges, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're trying really hard to make sure that we return to the days of in-person camaraderie to the greatest degree possible. Uh, certainly being in Washington, D.C. and being such a leader, not only from a revenue standpoint, but from a content standpoint, uh, you know, DE&I has become a topic that everyone is discussing. And uh, how has that changed at all within your organization? And what are you doing to uh, ensure that your staff is representative of, of what the look and feel of all of your communities? Um, it's different, in, again, it's different in every market. Market managers are expected to make sure that their teams reflect their community, but that's very different in the Twin Cities than it is in Chicago. Um, and that people are hired, fired, promoted based on the work that they do or they can do and not any other characteristic. Um, about them, about them, and that everybody be treated with respect and the same. So I, I think that is a tenant that my grandfather held true, and we've maybe reinforced it more recently. But we, ha we do not have an expansive DE&I program within the company. So I just want to talk about these three words because I love that you talk about this on your website, but when you describe your company, you talk about, you say you are passionate, strategic, and innovative. We try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think yeah. you don't just, you talk the talk, but you walk the walk as well. And I, the, the team that we have um, is, is passionate. They are innovative. What was the other word that we <laughs> hold true to? Strategic. And strategic. Um, we, we try. We, we try very hard to hold true to those things. And, and I think um, certainly the people that we have in this room today are all of those things and more. They are all of those things in spades, for sure. Well, with dignity and calm, which I think describes you so well, um, I, for one, I'm so thrilled that you are one of our leaders because so many of us look up to you, we depend on you, and we thank you for your great leadership, thank Jenny. Thank you, Erica, and thank you for all of your steady hand in, well, the, in this industry. Please join me in thank you, Jenny. <laughs> Jenny's gonna move to the next seat, and uh, joining us now, um, there's lots of words you could use to describe this next person. Um, Dignity and calm. Right there, right? He is a visionary. <laughs> um, he's definitely a mogul. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Oh, blah, good as Mike blah. wasn't working, was Check it? Check one, two, blah, oh, blah, blah. Okay, all right. <laughs> good morning. We don't have a lot of time, so let's get rocking. Let's go. Scott Borchetta, President and CEO of the Big Machine Label Group. Welcome to the jungle. I might just have to stand. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, Scott, you have such a relationship with the CRS over the years. <laughs> I don't think people really know. I got kicked out once by your ex-husband. <laughs> At the time he was. Charlie there. Cook. True story. <sighs> Hi, friends. Come on, Erica. Let's rock. This, so, it's Scott, too quiet in here. All right. Let's go. You know, he started in a punk rock band. Did you know that? Um, no, but so in 2005, uh, you started Big Machine. And Our 16th CRS, isn't that crazy? Yes. What was the vision then, and how has it evolved? So the vision then was, and I'm going to stand up just because I feel I can do more energy. Um, if you think about, yeah, come on, let's do this. I'm sorry. So seriously, if you think about where the industry was in that moment, you had this amazing thing that ho happened organically, and the first thing that we thought to do as an industry was to kill it. And so you had all these people running towards this 
this thing and all of a sudden you've got people posting music up and Napster became this incredible thing by accident. And I remember clear as day being on a conference call with the heads of DreamWorks out in LA, Mo Austin, legendary record guy, Lenny Warnker, et cetera, and all of the department heads. And I said, have you been on this thing, Napster? And they said, Scott, is that on your computer? I said, yeah. I said, get it off your computer right now. And I'm like, well, you don't know if this is a weed or a flower. Why do you want to kill it? And that was the beginning of where we are right now. And so the impetus was seeing all this money being wasted on things at a major label that made no sense to me. And it's like, you know what, I think we can build a new model and actually have something that is aggressive, specific, can move quickly, and really understand where it's going. Jim Urey, who's a great universal executive who ran universal distribution, I remember in, it would have been 1999, he came in and was talking about distribution and all the changes they were going to make, and they had this crazy idea called Jumpstart. And I'm not gonna get into it because I could waste an hour on that. But I'm looking at this, I'm going, and I, I literally said this, I said, Jim, this looks like dead man walking to me. He was like, he was very offended. I said, well, physical distribution, you're going the wrong way. And where are we now? So when we talk about where, well, that, that's the answer to that question. So that, that was the impetus of seeing all this waste, feeling like the leaders of our industry were going in the wrong direction. And I had some other wonderful, like-minded executives who were crazy enough to join me, so. You know, when you say Jim Murray, I haven't thought of that name. I, I remember him telling me that he said, what do you think is the number one thing that sells at Walmart? Bananas. Exactly. I was like, what? Crazy. True. Anyway, we digress. So technology is affecting everything. You know, you talked about Napster and, you know, how crazy is that? So how has technology continuing to change your business? What trends do you see? What are you looking for? And how do you actually stay on top of what's going on? So again, with technology is everything. Um, <laughs> when you think about terrestrial radio, it's 100 years old. When you think about cable television, it is now, gosh, it's 70 years old. So it took cable television 40 years to take over, basically. And things are moving so quickly. Sirius XM is only 20 years old. Spotify is 10 years old. TikTok isn't even three years old. I don't know how terrestrial radio can keep up. So for my business, we have got to be where everybody expects us to be. And so if terrestrial radio cannot join us in our new music, which we try very hard every day, and we continue to be successful, but nobody here is happy with it, okay? Not one person here at CRS is happy with the way that terrestrial radio moves. Our program director friends aren't happy with it. Record companies aren't happy with it. We, we know that this is a big challenge and a big problem. And I, the good news about this week is people are addressing it and we're talking about it. So my goal and initiative, I've got to be where people expect us to be. So if, if you're on TikTok, we need to be there. My last three hires for our label are people who are working TikTok. Because a crazy thing happened on the way to the pandemic. So in the middle of 2020, we locked down the label on March 13th. So everybody's working remotely. And so my weekly A&R meetings, a couple months in, this is blowing up on TikTok. And I look at this, I'm like, I'm not sure that that's an artist. That looks like a moment to me. Well, they're going to get a deal. I said, and we're not in that. The next week, another one. Warner's is all over this. They're going to sign us. I said, let them. And I said, stop. We're used to wagging the dog. The dog is wagging us. 
So we started a new part of our company that's called the Start Team. Every day they start conversations about our artists. Don't come in here and tell me this, because not any of those, by the way, who got signed for big deals have worked. Not one of them, not yet. I'm not saying it won't, but not one of them. The, now I'm not including fancy, like that was a huge moment. Walker, God bless him, he's been doing this for a long time. Everybody's very excited about that, but he had been working on that. I'm talking about a brand new artist who got a big record deal because of TikTok in that moment. So we're trying to understand how to use all these different platforms because we have got to be there. Scott, speaking of A&R, what do you look for? You know, as you said, is the tail wagging the dog, but how do you go about A&R? Very carefully. Um, <laughs> because, you know, we, we were so spoiled for so long. I've been doing this a long time now. Um, we used to have all the power, straight up. We used to be able to push down. We could work with our friends at radio. We could get things played enough. We could get positioning at Walmart and Target and Tower Records, if you remember them, and we could push hits. We could make you buy it for the most part. We can't do that anymore. So we have to have things that people are running toward. We've got to have some kind of story. If we're going to get all of our partners, terrestrial, DSPs, etc., there has to be more than just, we think this is great. We have to have something that backs it up. We've got to have some kind of moment, some kind of movement, and some kind of consistency. And I think within that, we can still build artist careers, but we've got to have something in that. So it's very hard to just go sign an artist that doesn't have anything happening and get that to blow up. We're still going to try it because we still fall in love with music and different artists every day. But ideally, you, you find that thing is, that's got a spark, and you go. The first thing that pops to mind is 10 years ago, Brantley Gilbert breaking out of the Southeast, and there was a thing happening. It's like, okay, let, he's ready for prime time. Let's go. And five million albums later, uh, I've got an artist named Kid G out of Georgia. 300 million streams, zero radio airplay. So we've got a huge story to bring to you, saying there's already something amazing going on with this artist. We're try we, I think we have to make it as easy as possible for radio to invest and have a whole plan, et cetera. But so the A&R question, the answer is we have to love it, and there has to be something that tells us people will run toward it. Mm -hmm. um, you certainly, as Scott Borchetta in your career, have had a fantastic relationship with country radio. And it's no secret that country radio and the country music industry have had a very special relationship all these years. Mm -hmm. But where do you see that relationship today? Where would you like to see it? Um, is it going to continue? Well, the good news is we do have great partners. And I think we're all trying to figure out this moment. But I think there's great news today. And I've been saying this all week. Your best friends are coming back to town. Country artists are your country fans and listeners' best friend. They're the party. Your best friends haven't been able to come to see you for two years. So if you're terrestrial radio, you know this. You're the conduit. You didn't get to say this for two years. Thomas Red is at the arena this week. Riley Green is in the conference room. We're doing a flyaway to Nashville to see Tim McGraw. That conversation is back. So whatever things you remember this week, please make sure that's one of them. You get the conversation back and own it. Because I think a year from now, one of the things that's gonna be a real highlight is us being back on the road and having that conversation again. Because we are getting killed by not having that. We got so spoiled, the two of us, terrestrial radio and records, because you were talking about us all day long. You were talking about our concerts, you were talking about all the things. Your best friends are coming to see you. So I think that's a really big piece that we can look for for this coming year, and hopefully next year, a lot of high fives to, to re-engage that moment. So I think we've got to have terrestrial radio to do that. You know, the DSP platforms, are, they do a good job as well, but they don't have that one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. So that is a huge opportunity that you, I hope you can't run back to your stations quick enough to, to get that message back on the air and as loud as possible. Yeah, it's a great opportunity. I have a huge, huge favor to ask you, and I don't think I've ever asked you for a favor. I've never asked you for a favor. 
but I would like you to eliminate the word terrestrial <laughs> from your vocabulary. How? And I say that because I have never heard anyone refer to a television station as a terrestrial television station. It's television. They say cable. Terrestrial? You say broadcast television, or you say cable television, or you say whatever Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime Let me Prime just are. give you a She's little history Are lesson. we going to waste time on this, really? Yes, because it's critical. Terrestrial... That word came into being because of satellite radio as they tried to reposition themselves against broadcast radio. So that's all I'm going to say on that. So, okay. Scott, let's talk about the revenue model of your business. It's really changed a lot. What does that look like today? It's so different. Um, we used to, at the end of the year, look at our album sales. I don't think he my argument, did he? You didn't, didn't win that one, no. <laughs> it's, it's terrestrial. I don't know what else to tell you. Um, the revenue Consumption, model. revenue yeah. model. So at the end of the year, I would always look at our album sales. Don't do that anymore. I look at our best consuming tracks. And it's fascinating because this is where our business is intersecting. This is where we're going to have to try to, to do better with new music because almost 80% of our revenue was from music that is 18 months or older. At 18 months, the industry considers that catalog. So our biggest consuming record of the year for the Big Machine Label Group, this is a really tough question, but I'll just, any guesses? It's a, it, you, you probably won't guess it. It was Nelly and FGL with Little Bit. Mm -hmm. That was not on country radio, but that song is on its way to a billion streams. If you think about the chronology, Cruise with Nelly and FGL is the biggest consuming single of all time. So there was a platform there, there was an invitation there, and Country Radio didn't want anything to do with it. And, that, and fairly, that was not an easy record to program. So that was our number one consuming record. The second biggest consuming song for the Big Machine Label Group last year was a song that's six years old by Brett Young called In Case You Didn't Know. Because that song keeps getting playlisted and people keep wanting to hear it. Okay, and all of my programmer friends are going, Scott, I told you. It's like, okay, I, I get it. So I think f there were three of our top ten that were old, older songs, Die a Happy Man and Cruise. So our biggest hits are still our biggest hits. So we're hiring a catalog person that is going to work strictly on those, those playlists to keep those things generating so we can continue to invest in new music. So it's all, you know, I don't know that we need to make an album that has any more than 10 songs on it. We could go back 30 years and Joe Galani would be telling you the same thing, different reason, but, you know, it's hard because an artist goes, well, it's my body of work. It's like, streaming says this song did 50 million, this one did 25, and then the rest of them did this. Mm -hmm. It's a hard conversation to have, but that is what's, that's what the data is telling us. So it's more than ever, for, for all of us, it's about those big, 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 big hits that hopefully are on their way to a billion streams. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the streams, and obviously radio has so many more tools from a research standpoint to determine what music they are adding, um, how are you restructured, or are you gonna change how you restructure your relationship with radio within Big Machine? That really ha depends on what radio does. You know, if, if it becomes more centrally located, do we need to go visit everybody? We still like to go visit everybody. Mm -hmm. But it has to make sense. So I would hope that, you know, for the, the people who are controlling this, that it's not in vain. Don't send us all over the country when the decision's already made. Give your people the power to be excited. Give them license to be excited. You know, one of the, the funnest things for me so far this year and for the, the big machine team is Jackson Dean. You know, it used to be almost expected that when an artist went to visit a station, put the ad on the board. It hasn't been that way for a long time. And Jackson is knocking them down on almost every stop. So it still can be done. So that kind of excitement, and hopefully with us coming back, your best friends are coming back, hopefully that kind of excitement can resonate whatever the hallways look like now. 
you know, that's one of the things we really missed out on this huge ad today that we had this, this past Tuesday is going, oh my God, GAR in Cleveland's first week. Oh my God, XTU, all these amazing colors, POC, MZQ, etc. That still gets us excited. You know, in the same way that Danielle Bradbury, who's not at Terrestrial Radio, is the cover of Hot Country on Spotify, and it's blowing up. So, uh, and I'll go there for a second. I have four artists right now that are living outside of the Terrestrial Radio world, um, only because it's too expensive. You know, when I look down and go, okay, this business model, if we don't make this investment that's going to take a year with an unprojectable result, we can build a consumption model for her and she can have a career. Because don't forget, all these people behind all these songs, those are real people. Yeah. They have a life, they have a career. And when I drop an artist, it's not like most of us that can just go get another job. When you get dropped, your career might be over on some level. So we're trying to look at creative ways for these artists that we know are incredibly talented, but how can they have a career? And so I just wanted to bring that up. And it's nothing against anybody. I'm just telling you how we're looking at our business right now so we can continue to, to survive and thrive. Well, it, it's so interesting when you think about years ago, a, a, an artist or, or in, in a station in a smaller market many times was the first time to add a record. Now, in many cases, they're the last person to add the record. It's almost easier to get a, a we won't, song. We won't name names. But it's almost easier to get a song added in a major market today than it is. Well, in that a just goes back to what I said about centrally programming. So, yeah. yeah, it's unfortunate, but you know, we'll just keep chipping away at that. We never give up on that. So you talk about A and R. You realize also the importance of a song. So you can have a great artist, but without the perfect song that great artist may never make it. So that's... It's a longer road, you know. They, they could make it. They could have really good. And, you know, one of my favorite qu quotes by Bono of you too is, great waits until very good gets tired. Hmm. So you've got to keep going. Very good, very good, very good. You go, ah, oh, great. So you can build that career and that, that moment, you know, they're playing Vince Gill before people walked in the room. I, I worked those Vince Gill records. <sighs> trying so hard, so hard, trying so hard, and then we get the song, you know, um, When I Call Your Name, Game Changer. So just because your first three or four or five, Reba McIntyre didn't have a hit song until 10 years into her career. We can't really do that anymore say, in this type anymore, of yeah. environment, but, you know, we're seven years into Danielle Bradbury, and she has a career. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we get that moment, and we go, okay, you know what? Radio as a song, here's a hit. It's got all the background, it's got X number of streams, etc. She's on tour, and you go, okay, this is a moment. I think radio tends to miss moments right now because we're so safe. Um, did they just turn the mains on? Um, <laughs> you, they haven't heard a word I've said. So, uh, <laughs> but like, like with the Nelly Little Bit record, it didn't need to play in, in all drive times, but you could have played it. You could have played it at night. You could, have, you could have used it. Don't forget that these are tools for you to use. So I want to encourage everybody to don't miss moments. It's our job to figure out the career. It's your job to figure out the moments. We know you can't play everything. Got it. But when something like that blows up and it's just blowing apart, Aaron Lewis, I know it's not for everybody, but it was the number one hot country song on Billboard for three weeks. It was our best-selling single for 2021. He has a very passionate audience. It's a tool. Do you want to use that, or do you want to let somebody else take it? Your investment is what you determine it to be, but don't miss the moments. Make it loud. People, you know, the Brantley Gilbert record is as crazy as it was, the worst country song of all time. A handful of stations played it and had a blast with it. We knew it wasn't going to go all the way, but the stations that used it, it was a big reaction record. It did what we expected it to do. It streamed well. On to the next one. Sometimes we get so attached. Be attached to being excited. Be attached to making moments. You know, something that we're working on, we're talking about, you know, can radio keep up 
with technology. Can a hundred year old technology keep up with today? You know, the things that we're working on with, with our bigger company, I'm working on my first AI artist. You know, where is that going to live? I know it's, where it's going to live. It might be so big that you have to deal with it, have to play with it, but we've already got a lane for it. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Borchetta. Thank you. And Scott's not only creating careers, just now he made a moment. So Scott, thank you for that. Um, RJ's gonna be uh, sharing some questions uh, from the audience, but there's a question I'd like to ask both of you. Uh, and Ginny, I'm gonna ask you first. As a, an, as a radio executive, is there one thing that you would most like to see the music industry do? Boy, I, I'm not prepared to give a good answer for that. Well, let me help you. No, I bet you can. <laughs> well, we'll get to you. <laughs> if you could ask Scott to do one thing, what would it be? Shut Greg, up. I need help. Yeah. I, you know, I, it's, it's been a partnership for many, many years, but we've got different business models, mm -hmm. obviously. And as technology evolves, the relationship is bound to change, obviously. Um, but I'm sure that we're gonna be important to each other for a very long time. And, and so trying to figure out how to work together and how to understand the pressures that each industry is, is going through. But in, in our case, you know, our programmers who are here, they are empowered to get excited. Mm -hmm. But it's not my job to make them excited. I'm, but they're empowered to be excited about a song and to add a song when they think it's appropriate to add a song because they know their audience. So, well, thank you for giving them the tools and the authority to do that. Mr. Borchetta. And it's your job to get them excited. Done. Got it. <laughs> All right, Scott, what is the thing you would most like to see the radio industry do for your business? <clears throat> Everybody could tell you the answer. Find a way to move faster. You know, and we can't leave people in the dust, but if, you, if we're just programming to a lean back audience, is that really what we want? I know you're, you're so constricted right now to try to figure out, you know, the national business is a disaster. Your agency business is, is so tough. So, you know, I would look at all of the companies in here and take a couple of stations and just try some crazy shit. You know, there's gotta be some opportunity, whether it's a certain day part, whether it's a, a station in a smaller market, whatever it is, if you don't try something, you're here, you're on the ground, you see that we care, but you also see that we can't wait. And so let's find a way to, to be aggressive and maybe we can retrain. And again, being on the road is gonna help us. I really believe this, I really do but let's find a way to try to move some of these things quicker because maybe we can create an urgency with your listeners of like, I gotta pay attention. You know, I remember growing up in Los Angeles, man, if, if I didn't have KMET or KLOS on the radio, I felt like I was missing out. I couldn't wait to get home from school or get in the car so I can hear what, what Joe Ladd was talking about. You know, so how do we create that sense of urgency and go, you know what, you don't miss this. Don't miss this. Don't miss this moment. Don't miss what we're doing. Tune in and turn on. Try crazy shit. Amen. I like that. RJ? Scott and I grew up listening to the same two radio stations, <laughs> KMET and KLMS in Los Angeles. Can still rock in America. Uh, this one's for Scott, and then I think we're running a little late, so sorry. Um, how do labels expect radio to make music decisions based on consumption info that is not complete or transparent from the DSPs? You know, that I'd, I'm, I'm not really in that conversation. You know, I, you hope that real information is being shared. So, you know, shame on anybody who's not, you know, it's, RJ, that, that question is, we, we could debate that for a long time, but, you know, I was talking to Mike Moore the other night about a song that he's playing, and I think he's the only one playing it, and consumption in that market has gone from, okay, that's pretty good, to wow. 
So I think there's a way to really get, you know, very specific and detailed to make sure you're getting good information. You know, if somebody just comes out and goes, oh, we got 300 million spins, it's like, well, show me. You know, that could be across 25 tracks or it could be one song that's really blowing up. So I think both of us just ask better questions. You know, we, we ask you, you ask us. So just show me. I think we all want the narrative to everything that we're doing right now. You know, nobody wants to go, oh, okay, well, got, got it. It's like, well, wait a minute, what's going on there, you know? So I, I hope that kind of answers your question, but you know, if you're not telling the truth, that's gonna be exposed. So you don't have a chance to win that. Well, I knew this was gonna happen, and I'm sorry we're running late, but um, again, please join me in thanking Scott You should have heard Erica cuss Moore. earlier. I've never, <laughs> like a truck driver. Hey, thanks a lot. Your best friends are coming back to town. Tell your listeners. Let's go. Let's have a great year. Thanks, everybody.